Ah, uh, yes. Well, hello, and welcome to another evening of Deep Sky streaming here on Sky Tour live stream. I have an uh, announcement to make, which uh, I think is kind of cool. Um, you know how we have t shirts and things you can get, mugs and all sort of stuff with the Sky Tour live stream logo on it. Well, now we have a deck of playing cards, which the face of every card is a different object that we've taken in Sky Tour live stream. And the back of the card has the observatory with Sky Tour live stream on it. So I will uh, make the announcement as to when and where those will be available. But we're going to make those available for our donors, people that want to uh, uh, donate to the Sky Tour live stream. Um, and I haven't figured out the way to do that yet. I might do a Patreon. I'm not sure. Um, but either way, I just want to keep Sky Tour live stream running, keep it going. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, a lot of expense, you can imagine. So, um, what took so long to get in tonight? Well, tonight I actually have the new computer running, and Marianne's in the chat, and she knows about some of this. Um, and what I did was um, I started up the new computer, and it got everything running, got the telescope running, then when I did it in practice and actually connected everything, uh, the screen was updating so slow, I couldn't figure out why. And it might be something to do with the network connection. So rather than mess with that, which I was going to use tonight, I decided I'm going to just go back to the old system for a while. So I did. I have the old computer running right now, and that's fine. You know, that, that'll be just fine. Anyway... This is the brightest star in Cygnus, the swan. And uh, this star is Deneb. And it is the main star that we always see when we look up in the sky overhead. We see, uh, we see Deneb, part of the Northern Cross, which is when we put in our constellations. Uh, okay, that's what's happening here too. Hmm. Deneb means tail, by the way. I would think it would, because that is the tail of... Uh, introduce me, please, Mark. Introduce you. Uh, and you are... Folks, this is Daryl Mason over here uh, with us, as you know. Daryl is a fixture with SkyTour Livestream and SkyTour Radio. And um, I uh, apologize, Daryl. I was just so caught up with trying to... Yeah, I know. Stay what was going wrong here. Um, yeah. So well, yes. say what's right. Daryl's here. Hey, yeah. everybody. Oh, that is correct. Ta -da. That is what's right. You know, right. you're going to have to teach uh, Mary Ann and Tara how to uh, work on telescopes, Mark. You think? I think. Mm. Yeah, that could be a problem. Tell him you want to raise, Mary Ann. Okay, uh, just don't listen to him, Mary Ann, because, uh, you know, it's, it's just not that easy. So anyway, um, <clears throat> it was kind of a problematic situation tonight, and uh, I couldn't understand why this was causing such problems. Uh, I still, I still don't know. Um, so it was really uh, quite a little bit of a disaster out there. Marianne knows kind of what I'm talking about. Um, she knows I got everything running, but she doesn't know that it, it broke down. Uh, so it did. It broke down. All right. So uh, we'll be okay. In any case, um, if you look in the Cygnus Milky Way here, this is the swan. And when Daryl said that we're looking at Deneb as the tail of the swan, he's absolutely right because there is the tail. Here's the body and here's the head. The head, of course, is that beautiful star, my favorite double star in the sky, Albirio. And Albirio is just beautiful. Uh, and... <laughs> Right now, we're focused on Deneb, although you can see it right there. Uh, it's not too exciting. Uh, we'll take a 25-second exposure of it, though, at 6400 ISO. For those that are just joining us who don't have a familiarity with how we do things, this is the telescope control section over here. Telescope movement, telescope computer, filter wheel attached to the telescope right here. And I'm able to get a hold of uh, different types of filters to look at different parts of the sky. Um, uh, I'm sorry, different parts of the spectrum in the sky. Uh, so down here below is me. This is ops control here. 
Then we have on this side over here, we have the camera control set up over here, the camera cluster. And there's another, uh, another one that I use and that I have at all times, and that is uh, this guy. This is the telescope view looking in the dome right now. It's a pan tilt uh, system, so we can actually go look at the telescope at any time, see what it's doing. And this is a low light infrared, so we can actually see what's going on in the pitch black of the dome. And it won't affect our views. So this is really nice. Um, and I think that um, we are you know, moving along. We're making progress. And I'll figure out what was going wrong with this new computer. Because it's about six times faster than the one this is on right now. So it should actually not have a problem. <clears throat> Maybe I'll have Daryl figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want a raise too. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. So do I. I'll give you a raise. Twice zero yeah. is still zero because that's what I get paid. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, uh, just don't multiply by zero. Well, divide by zero, you mean. Or right? divide by zero. Because then we'd make infinite amounts of money. Yeah. Hey. I want to say hi to Tim F. I want to say hi to P and K Space and everything. And it's Keith. How you doing, man? Tara's here. Mary Ann's here. Terry Groff uh, was here. And hopefully he's still here. He said, good night. Best show you ever did, Mark. He said, kind of a funny joke. Um, and uh, of course you're here Marson's here, hi Marson and uh, there might be others that I missed so far so I'll check it, I'll check it out but in any case we're going to be just cruising through uh, the northern sky we're going to actually play around in uh, Cassiopeia and Cepheus a little bit tonight too because there's some really cool things in those constellations that we're going to check out as well it can be a lot of fun you know, Cepheus is underrated. There are a lot of good deep sky things there. Aren't there? I mean, yeah, it is true. It is absolutely true. There are so many very good things in that, that constellation. Um, so I think that um, we'll have some fun. So let's begin. First of all, uh, I have to do a little housekeeping, which I did on the other computer and didn't realize I could do on this computer. And I'm going to do that now. Uh, not this. Uh, oh, it's up in here. Tools, settings, and under the filter wheel settings, I can actually put in names for the different filters. So this is, the first one we have is uh, what's called a narrow band filter, and it's a very, very small filter segment. So when we have a spectrum of the star from red all the way down to blue, um, the narrow band filter looks at tiny little pieces across this whole spectrum, but only tiny little pieces, little tiny pieces get through. The rest is, is excluded. Why would that be valuable? Because all of the most important stuff we want to see is usually in those tiny pieces. And the second filter we have on position two of our filter, you can see the number two there. Uh, this is another narrow band, but it's actually a slightly wider narrow band. And we call it narrow band two, uh, and that's slightly wider chunks through the spectral band. Hey, Farva, welcome back. Good to see you again. Uh, and it's nice, to, nice to see you. Or you were gonna say something, Daryl? Sorry. Oh, I'd say give them fun names. I mean, like, like, like what? You still with me? Uh oh. Where'd you go? Sorry. Uh, dongle again. Oh, okay. okay. I'm back. I thought your computer decided to say, nah, no more fun for you. Uh, no, I I think I said uh, call the first one narrow band and call the second one not so narrow band. I don't have enough text to do that across yeah, the Yeah, I, I see that. Yeah. Yeah, and then next, the next filter is a spectral a gradient band, and that's a spectral gradient. Marson, thank you so much. That's really, really... Oh, man, that's cool. <laughs> Look at Marson throwing down a raise. Okay. Uh, that's really cool. That's really cool. And Farva makes a comment about the mighty Colorado. Absolutely. You know, I've seen the mighty Colorado, but only from the air. Filter four is just a dark plate uh, because we actually need to take dark frames sometimes. And that's what does it for us. And filter five is just a pass through. It's an absolutely just, it's just a pass through. It just passes through white light. 
Okay, so I say okay, and now when I come back, when I come back to our gear, you'll see that our uh, filters, uh, I must not have stated that I wanted to change the names. I have to go back to that. Let me just go back to here. It worked on the other computer. I see Randy Harris is here. Hey, Randy, how are you? Randy's saying hi to you too, Daryl. Yes, I said hi to Randy. You did? Oh, in the, in, did. in in here, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. Oh, I know what has to happen. Uh, for that to change, I have to st uh, start the program over again. Okay. Which I can do. That's easy enough. So I will quit that program. Tara, if you want best mighty Colorado, you need to see the upper Colorado. That is the Colorado in the state of Colorado. Where Daryl is from. It's a beautiful alpine stream, and it turns into quite a big river before it leaves the state. Quite a torrent. They used to call it the Grand River, and it wasn't called the Colorado until uh, the Green River entered it over in Utah. Wow. There's your history lesson for the day. Yep, that's a great, great lesson. Okay, so as you can see now, our filters have the appropriate names. All right. We are on narrow band two right now, and if I switch to narrow band one, it's even fainter, and you can see that the bright star Deneb is now just faint right here. Let me get rid of that stuff. Um, and then if we go back one more, we'll go back to a pass-through, which is just a blank hole and now you can see many more stars in the view and it's not in focus because when we put a filter in front of our camera uh, sensor the filter will cause the camera sensor to be uh, requiring a different uh, I'm sorry will require a different focus of the telescope because the light is focusing at different locations uh, so that's how that works so now let's go to our our beautiful Stellarium linked system here. And Can let's, I add something? You may. Uh, when Deneb is, uh, when Deneb means tail, uh, Deneb the star in Cygnus is not the only Deneb in the sky. There uh, are several. True. There's uh, Denebola, which means tail, tail of the lion. Yep. And there's Deneb Kytos, which means the tail of the whale. Mm. And we're coming up on that time of year to see. Uh, Cetus now, Cetus or Kytos. Mm -hmm. That is fantastic, oh. yeah. Uh, anyway, sorry. No, no, it's fine. There's no sorry here. This is all good. Okay, and you'll see that many times I'll actually uh, close down the observatory cam so we can see our, our planetarium view here. And right now, if we put up our guides, you'll see that up at the zenith, almost, this is, this is now the horizon view uh, lines okay so this is just our local horizon with lines where 90 degrees is at the top if we actually turn on the lines that our, the telescope is using then you'll see that it looks like we're on a, the globe on the side because of the fact that we're looking at the earth's uh, coordinate system extended out into space here's the north pole right there up top all right and uh, you'll notice that uh, if you get even closer to the North Pole, you'll see something interesting, and that is that uh, Polaris is not actually right on the North Pole. Uh, it's off by a, a little bit, and that little bit is... Uh, actually, I need my stars, don't I? Yeah, you'll notice that the Polaris is off the, poles by, by, by off the pole by a little bit. So you can't just uh, point at Polaris. You have to point at the North Pole, and that depends on the time of the night and so forth, uh, where you're going to put your telescope. All right. So that said, um, let me get out of this now. All right. So here, okay, we are looking at uh, constellations that are setting and about to set, and this is the equatorial coordinates, we call them, where we see the North Pole as being where that they all converge. But we tend to use uh, these 
horizon lines, that is to say, our local horizon, just so we can do things like, say we want to look at this cluster. We can look at this cluster and say, ah, if we clicked on this cluster, we can look up here and get a lot of information about it. We can also see how high it is above the horizon. Right now it's 35 degrees above the horizon. You see that right there. So it's alt as altitude and azimuth, azimuth altitude. And the altitude, that tells us a lot about whether we're going to see anything really good. Below 30 degrees, it's kind of blah, all right? But above 30 degrees, it looks great. And when we open up the Arizona Observatory, uh, it's going to look quite nice. Most of the stuff we look at is going to be beautiful. So tonight, let's go check out the Eastern Veil uh, right this moment because it's almost at the zenith meaning it's almost directly overhead. So we're going to tell the telescope to go there, and the telescope will first find a star uh, that is a, a good guide star, that is a star that could be used for um, an alignment, and then it'll actually then take that star, and there it is right there, and it's going to move it to the center of the field, and then it's going to go zipping from there, from that position, uh, this is Aljana, uh, as soon as that star is centered in the automatic guide scope set, him, set up, then it'll say, okay, now that I know where it is, I'm going to go now to this place where I know exactly where it is. And so we're going to go from this star down to here. And when I take a picture, it's going to be right here. So we just went off to it and the telescope will now get us there. And I'm using the uh, white light pass through right now, but I'm going to change that. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm using narrowband one. Sorry. That's why I don't see stars now. That's good. All right. And so now once the telescope settles out and we don't have anything to hang out with, notice we have, we don't have to hang out waiting for anything else. We see north, south, east, and west are not grayed out anymore. Uh, when they are moving somewhere, you'll see those things gray out. All right. That's those guys up there. So uh, now let's just take a, a exposure. Let's go and pump up. This is the settings for the camera over here we're going to say instead of 6400 iso we're going to go and do uh 25600 and what the heck we'll see if we can do a good 30 second shot of that all right and if that works i i i did tune the uh uh i did tune the uh guider so that it would go to small increments and manage because the way the guider works is it moves around uh, the star and tries to keep the star uh, within a certain range. Well, I made those numbers very small, so it, it, it keeps the star right within the range and doesn't do too much movement. Otherwise, you'll see streaks. You know. Hey there, Rockstar. What's going on? Nice to see you. And look at that. Wow. Ta-ra. Ta wow. What a beautiful image. Now you'll notice that there's some noise in this image. That's because we're taking it at a ISO speed of 26,000. But I can get rid of some of that right away with a little instant processing. And look at that. Now we can see some beautiful imagery. Uh, now I get a little streaking going on there. So I think I'm going to uh, take this photo again. I should have waited about 11 seconds for the camera to get a, a guide star. And I did not. Had I waited, then it would have been a much better shot. So we'll do it again. So how is everybody doing out there? Hey, Greggy. How are you? Greggy Gilgan is here. Brian Cox is great. Yep. Ah, you hurt your brain in a good way. Yeah. He's good. You know, we, we he and I share a, a similar, um, yeah, I guess, flair for the dramatic. We like to... We like to make things clear in a way that's fun you know make it fun to learn you know yeah see now our image looks better this is an expanding supernova remnant and look at how beautiful and gossamer this is i i you know and, and daryl and i both have said time and again we have not been able to see this better than we have been seeing it in this telescope uh recently now um, it's been clear for the last three days and you might say, well, why weren't you streaming? Why have you forsaken us? Well, um, the answer is because, uh, the sky was sort of blue, but it was almost like a bluish orange, um, bluish gray. 
because we had high altitude haze from the fires all the way out in California and Arizona. It finally made its way here, folks. And I'm in Connecticut. So it went 3,000 miles. It actually went all the way to Europe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They were seeing it in the Netherlands. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been awful here. Uh, really hazy and smoky at times. And yeah. uh, I went out before bedtime last night and the uh, stink of the smoke was awful. I believe it. I believe it. In fact, I've been kicking myself all week. Uh, Monday was a nice, clear night, but I was tied up. I, should, I was wanting to drag one of the scopes up. Yeah. Hey there, guys, fellas. How are you? Isabella Melamed, how are you? And my music odds and, and odds and sods. <laughs> Great to see you. Thank you for joining us. Um, make sure you guys who haven't subscribed, go ahead and subscribe. It's free. You know, and then you might get the alerts to say, hey, when we're going on. And it, I think it's going to be... A, a very very nice especially once we get opened up in Arizona once we get that um, then we're gonna have two observatories running at the same time we're gonna have this one open and we'll have a Arizona open they might we'll start the evenings with Connecticut and then we'll transfer over to Arizona when the sky gets dark out there and go for more uh, deep sky uh, dreamy objects out there I absolutely love Arizona and most of you who know me know that um, the temperature out there is conducive to wanting to stay there for a long time and that is my plan I'm going to actually um, be making sure that I get out to Arizona on a more permanent basis so that's that's just something that's what can I say gotta do it you know so this is the Veil Nebula supernova remnant. It's the eastern side. As you can see, it's got an arc to it. That's because inside here, you know, down here, okay, uh, down down in this down in this section right here, this is where actually it's more like over here, okay, down here uh, in this region. You can't see it's way down here out of the shot. That's where the original progenitor, the star that used to be was before the star blew up and has been blowing material out like this ever since and as it does that material moves out and out and out and it spreads and as it moves out it also hits stuff in the interstellar medium what is that stuff it hits locations that have other densities of material like this right here see that this is another area where there was some density differences and so it broke up the expanding cloud of material and caused it to have all these beautiful little undulations that you see here. And that is from the outward force of the supernova going out and then striking other gas and, and dust that's in this interstellar medium out here in this particular location. And that is something that when we uh, consider supernovae, we have to consider that supernovae are actually um, objects that are going to um, eventually disperse but in the interim while they're actually out you know, expanding um, their work isn't done they continue to help stars form by causing these compression and shock fronts along the front areas like for instance this right here you can see this right here this guy right here this this is a, a beautiful little arc and this arc that you see here this is a expansion uh, front and along that front you see how it looks you can see the line in the front that's because it's dense there and that density that you're looking at right there is something that can potentially cause other material in that location to start condensing and form other stars and possibly even other planetary systems most likely planetary systems actually so planets are kind of a, a natural expectation now uh, in our view and so we see planets that are, are you know around stars that are relatively young um, and the planets are relatively young we see stars that have planets that are in full maturity because the stars are more than past their middle of their lives like our Sun and we see planets that have survived the death of their star um, but only the ones that are far away uh, from the star. Now the thing is, 
these planets too uh that we're looking at these planets are also very uh prone to being uh grabbed by other gravitational influences if the stars are involved with uh flybys of other stars then the planets that are around these stars could actually get pulled away and so it turns out more than we ever thought there's actually a lot of what we call rogue planets out there planets with no home planets with no star to warm them and may i ask uh yeah uh are you referring to the recent uh, news about there being a lot more brown dwarfs than they ever thought that's part of the uh, that's part of the finding yeah because the brown dwarfs typically might be in a solar system or a star system but finding them isolated means that they were uh, possibly ejected from a star system of some kind you know um, right however um, there are just rogue planets out there planets that just don't have any home you know can you imagine that it's like space 1999 where the moon gets blasted out of earth orbit and takes off into space you know amazing how week to week the moon would encounter new aliens because the moon you see must be traveling faster than light by far uh, of course it wasn't but you know they were running out of ideas <laughs> you know and I watched that show religiously and, and it was the poorest uh, really bad special effects but you know what it was lousy yeah. sci-fi but it was the best we had it's all we had so so there's the veil and let's go and head back to um, our our view here that's one side of the veil now on the other side this is a good view to show you the overall image here so boom it exploded right here this object exploded right in the center here okay and you might think this is the guy that exploded but that's actually not the one that's actually another that's a star that's uh, just a uh, um, a star that happens to be uh, it's, it's closer it's a, it's a much closer it's a foreground star though the the, uh, the veil supernova took place out here way past this star by more than three times its distance um, over here on the other side toward the western side okay uh, this right here is another location that is really interesting and let's go see it we're gonna go to the star 52 Cygni which is this one right here 52 Cygni again is a foreground star it's one that happens to be along the line of sight but it has it, it's actually not uh, it's not exactly at the distance uh, of this particular nebula, all right? So, let me see. I, I think I looked that up during our last stream. Uh, yeah. Fitch 2 Cygni was like less than 200 light years away or something. And uh, yeah. I, I want to say <laughs> the veil itself uh, About was said to be like 16 or 1700 light years actually, away. Yeah, maybe 1400, yeah. 1400. Yeah. Well, you know, it varies. These things are notoriously hard to find, uh, uh, you know, distances to sometimes. Okay, we're going to go now here. You'll watch this is our telescope indicator you see right here. And you'll, want, you'll notice it as I say, go to this side of the nebula, okay, which I just did. You'll see that move. You might see the uh, occasional star go through the field here as well. Okay, this is our locator star. We're just coming in now, and as we zoom out, we can see that it's going again to Algena. And from Algena, it knows how to get to all these different places. It's not the only star. Any bright star anywhere in the sky can serve as a guide star for the telescope to find its way. And I, it's called high precision slewing, and I do this, or high precision pointing, I do this because I wanna make sure that I find the things that I'm looking for right away. And there we go. The star whips out of view. And here comes 52 Cygni. All right. And you'll see it. There it is. 52 Cygni is that bright star. It's here. It is in our planetarium. And here it is right here. There it is. See him right there, little guy? <laughs> yeah. And we will be uh, checking out uh, 52 Cygni and uh, what it has <clears throat> what it has in store for us here in just a minute. So let's go and look at 52 Cygni. But first, knowing knowing that I know what this thing is looking like, I'm going to move it over. 
And I'm going to bring it down a little bit. Why would I do this? Well, you'll see as soon as I take the picture. Okay. So let's do 30 seconds at 25,600 right now. And I'm going to wait the full time for my guide star to be captured um, by the system. Yeah. Okay. And now let's take that picture. In SkyTour Livestream, we use very powerful cameras so we can show you amazing things in just 30 seconds or one minute. Uh, many times people have to take multiple exposures for uh, hours of time overall to get beautiful shots. And I would have to do the same if I wanted to actually do a very, very, very nice shot. But what I'm doing is to show you the deep sky in an instant um, in a way that no one ever has. And that's what sky to live streams all about you know uh anahata 77 hello bonnie how are you and this is that beautiful filamentary object look at it this is uh, go ahead uh, oh i'm sorry that's just amazing it is pretty isn't that, that that's just beautiful and then let me just get some rid of some of the noise you can see that look at that and this is a 30 second photo and um, Amanda Curran, who is our, also our co-host within uh, SkyTour Livestream, uh, was with me the night I saw this for the very first time. Just so you know, I have never, ever, have never seen this object before SkyTour Livestream. Before I brought it in the telescope for the first time, I had never seen this. And when I brought this in, I don't mean this segment, I mean the entire thing. I never saw it in my life because I always lived in an area where the lights were too bright to ever see it. Well, once I moved to this location in Connecticut, and once I ended up um, getting the telescope set up here and decided to do this, I was stunned to see all the detail. Let's go back now. It looks like we're getting some good shots here at 30 seconds, so I'm gonna go and do a one minute shot and to do that, I'm going to go to bulb mode, which is this, and say, okay, go. And now we'll come back to, mm. you rubbed your, your beard against your microphone there, Daryl. Something like that. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. I thought you were commenting on my commentary. And I was like, oh. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Uh, I know. I... You're, you're a good guy. You're a good guy. Hello, Cindy Murphy. Hello, Papa Tom. Good to see you. Hello there. Uh, and I see that we have uh, David Byrne back with us. Thank you. Good to see you again. Hope you guys are having a good night. And those of you that are out there who haven't subscribed, why don't you subscribe? You know, you get to see this every time. Look, look what we do. You know, where else could you see an astronomer dance around in the night sky like this? Okay, that's what happens here. And yeah, I am an astronomer. That's what I went to school for. Why would I do that? I wasn't interested in making money, I guess. <laughs> but it's okay. You need to do this for the passion of it, you know? You know, and right now we're we're doing a one minute shot of this very object, so it's gonna look oh, look at that. Look how much brighter it looks. Look at how much more beautiful this looks. Look at that. Wow. Gosh, that's really how, gorgeous. How to make a small fortune as an astronomer. Start with a large fortune. Hey, that's right. That's right, and that's a very good point because what do we do with a large fortune? We buy equipment. Yeah. I have to say, uh, hello there, NLP channel. How are you? Um, oh, thanks for subscribing. Uh, I'm glad you're here. Thanks for coming. And, you know, to you and everybody here, um, you know, when I first started doing this, um, I figured I'm going to, I want to do a, I want to put an observatory in Arizona as well. And, uh, people were saying, "Ah, oh, you know, you're getting, you're getting, your eyes are getting too big. You know, don't, don't be setting your sights for that. You know, that's a, that's a long way away. And it's very expensive and blah blah blah." So I started a GoFundMe, um, and uh, you know, Marianne Rob, who has been here in the chat, has helped me with the GoFundMe as well. And I ended up reaching almost double the goal I had set. And it gave me enough to actually build the observatory out there, which we're doing uh, next week. Um, and I'll be there for that. And it also gave me enough to uh, buy the instrument 
uh, that is going out there. That's this instrument we're using tonight is actually the Arizona scope in Connecticut being tested and put through its paces. The computer initially has been a failure uh, because of the timing, but I think it's related to not having uh, a stronger internet signal out there. Out in the desert, I'm going to have a stronger signal than I do here in Connecticut, believe it or not. Uh, so it'll be interesting. I'll test that when I have more time. But since I was going to stream with you tonight, I wanted to stream with you and put it out there that I was going to, I didn't want to go make you wait much longer. As it is, I was a half hour late. I am so sorry. You know, I didn't want to be a half hour late. If you're putting in the time to come here, I want to make sure I have the, you, you give you the respect of being here. So I apologize for being late. Um, interesting feature here, Daryl, that we talked about before. If I, we scroll down here a little. This 52 Signy, you're, you're tempted to think that 52 Signy has something to do with illuminating this area right here. And it absolutely does not. This here is right up next to this nebula. This star is way up in the foreground. So the star is like way up here. Okay, and the nebula is way back here. Okay, so they have nothing to do with each other, but it's tempting to say that it might. And hello there, Daisy and Zoe. Nice to see you. Say hello to Lane for me. Lane is a relative of Daisy and Zoe, and Lane often comes in and uh, watches the streams. So it's very nice. So now we're going to do another something that's really kind of cool. Down below this, look at look at how turbulent that looks. A word I like to use, which I'm not even sure is a word, and I should know this, is turbulated. I think that's a word. It's turbulated. It looks like a twister, doesn't it? Yeah, I said the other day, it, it has is. quite a sort of a vortex look to it. It looks yeah. like it's twisting. It sure does. Um, I think that's an illusion because I don't think it's twisting. <clears throat> it's not subject to the, the, the forces that would make it do that. But... Um, I do think it's pretty amazing. So as we drop down, you see 52 Cygni, and you see this star here with this really cool little nebula. And what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to uh, come back, and there is 52 Cygni down here. Let me just get my, my fat head out of the way. Okay. And you can see the bouncing there. That's actually got some wind. We have some wind out there. And what I'll do now is I'm going to bring up our telescope control section. Let me actually bring you to the right screen. Okay, and now I'm going to move that up there to show you what's down below 52 Cygni in the same nebula. Okay, so now you see it's up there, right? So let's do another one minute, 25,600. Okay, after we get our guide star. And we at about 11 seconds I think we're there and now we can start this exposure yep and there we go and as you can see I uh, right here we're using our narrow band one our narrow band one filter right there and this narrow band one filter is uh, the filter that actually takes out most of the light and we'll go to narrow band two for the next shot and you'll see a marked difference in how they look. <laughs> Thanks, Marson. Yeah, turbulated. I mean, it, it kind of, it, it's turbulence, but really, you know, uh, prolonged, you know, so it's, it's, and it's, uh, extended. So it's turbulated. Um, might actually be a word, but. I'll tell you, it's really, really pretty. Terrell, you might be able to answer Marson's question. Are there any memorable stories anyone has had while observing overnight? Uh, too many, Marson. I'd have to have a little context to go for that. Okay. Look at this. This is what's hanging out below. 52 Cygni. Let's back out a little. There's the star again with that little fantastical piece. And then we've got this beautiful structure down below here. Let's go and just take away some of that. Let's do another shot. But let's do this again. But 
Now I'm going to go to Narrowband 2. Narrowband 2 is not quite as restrictive and we'll see a little bit more. And your initial thought will be to say, well, hey, why not use that? That looks better than the other. But I'd have to show you the difference. They do make a difference. They do make a difference. Okay, these these filters uh, they show detail that you just miss otherwise it would these with, with the, your naked eye. If I took a naked eye picture of this, I should do that just to show you what you're really seeing. <clears throat> the view through a telescope, for instance, will not look the same unless you actually use a filter to look at this object. But see what your eye is doing that the, the, the or what your eye can't do, I should say is it can't accumulate the light like a camera sensor. See, we're doing 60 seconds right now in the, in this mode right here, this exposure. 60 seconds of accumulated light. So it's adding together on the on the sensor. And that's why the telescope has to be perfectly guiding, you know, uh, all the way and left and right, and, and it's doing its thing. It can't be zipping all around. So it has to be perfectly guided. And that's what it's doing all by itself. Oh, look at that. Yeah, so now you can see what a one minute shot of this looks like with this new, this other filter. And let's get rid of some of the noise. Look at this beautiful color. Look at this color. Okay. That, that color is absolutely stunning. Wow. It's called the witch's broom. That is correct. You were right. Yep. Yeah, and, and I still like this little nebula right there. Look at that. That nebula right there. That little cool nebula in, in the uh, in the veil right there. That is so cool. I like that. You know? And then uh, we have a similar thing right here. And this is something you asked about one time before, Daryl. You said, could this actually be a shock front of some kind over here, you know? And it, mm -hmm. it, it, it could be, you know? And you notice a string of stars, and you say, "Hey, could those have been formed by, uh, you know, collision uh, and star formation left in the wake of this passing shock wave from this material?" Those are on the other side, but we would look for some on the inside curve, where the actual uh, supernova took place and heading outward. That's what we would like to do, um, and that would be a really good study, you know, to do. Oh, Randy, what do you mean you got to go? A golf tournament tomorrow? Wow. But you know what? Famous famous quote by... I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you go for it. Famous quote by Samuel Clemens, a.k.a. Mark Twain. Mm -hmm. Golf is a good walk wasted. <laughs> Nothing personal, Randy. Uh, that is funny, Randy. You gotta admit. You gotta admit. Hey there, Gina Leone. I worked on a golf course for a while, a long time ago, and... Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'll just leave it at that. All right. And Terry Groff looked up turbulated. Terry Groff's a friend of mine from Dallas, Texas. You know, we got, we hung out together when we, we actually worked on a National Geographic show together out there. And uh, Terry and I, uh, good friends. He's a good guy. And uh, he uh, he looked up turbulated and found in, in Merriam-Webster that there's no such word. I know. <laughs> You know, I, I think it's made up, you know, and I think I, 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 I think it is a perfect word to explain what's really going on in some of these nebulae up here. This thing right here is just, you know, there, this is a turbulated appearance, you know, it really is. It should be a word if it's not, you know. Not yet, anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe but, you coined the word. I, well, I, I'm sure I just reinvented it, you know, but look at, look at how subtle these colors are, guys. This green. Now, this greenish blue, that actually is oxygen. And you say, oxygen? Well, we breathe oxygen. Yeah, but this is only oxygen atoms. Uh, and there might be some oxygen molecules there, but there's mostly oxygen atoms. And these were uh, elements that were made in, the, in some stars' uh, cores. And then when those stars blew up, that material was scattered to the interstellar medium and then new stars were made from all of that new stuff. And so, in a star's atmosphere, you're going to find elements that it couldn't possibly make using the normal fusion process that makes elements. You know, like 
two hydrogens get crushed together to make a helium and you know the helium gets crushed together to make carbon atoms and so on and so forth um, and so we don't see that uh, material we don't see that stuff being made in some of the stars yet they have these materials in their atmospheres and that's because they were made with this stuff and that's just sitting in their atmosphere there's hydrogen as the, as the fuel primarily for those stars and to a lesser extent helium in later years but those stars end up um, dying a very different death because they're not big massive stars if they can only fuse hydrogen into helium and possibly helium into carbon a little bit okay in other words stars like the sun okay stars like the sun do that but stars like this they could explode these have elements in their atmosphere that they were made with as well so some of that is what we see here some of it could also be oxygen that was made in the star's core and expelled when the star we call it we don't say blew up we say disrupted hmm go figure like who are we we must be arrogant or something disrupted is what we say about a star i say the star blew the heck up it went supernova <clears throat> and when it did uh, all of its guts were spewed to the interstellar medium isn't that romantic ah yes my stellar jewel in the sky its guts splattered to the interstellar medium no longer a beautiful star laid waste by a supernova i mean you could use that right <laughs> and say that so in any case that's um that's what this looks like but the the star the reason these are glowing is because there is a lot of heat uh, latent heat left over from this expulsion here uh generated by radiation pressure radiation from uh, other stars in the area and stars that they're colliding with the, the heat generated by collision with the interstellar medium and then the star that's left behind is going to be a very very uh, hot neutron star and that very hot neutron star is going to give off mostly ultraviolet and that's very very high energy radiation and that will cause uh, gas like this to glow and so besides collisional excitation with hitting the interstellar medium you also get uh, that uh, glow caused by the neutron stars that are left behind so it's pretty interesting how this all works and I just think that uh, uh, yeah Marson that's cute I think that that's what happens you know Marson goes uh, star core was like ah <laughs> in a sense but what happened was you know the star is constantly fighting trying to collapse on itself because it's so massive that it wants to collapse all the time the only thing keeping it from collapsing is that outward pressure of the radiation from the constant fusion that's going on in the very core of the star way in the center that energy generation is what keeps the star uh, basically the size it is if that wanes the star shrinks a little if it gets more the star will expand a little there are stars which do that that vary and pulsate these are called variable stars, and they could vary, they could vary because of the fact that they are uh, changing the size of their core and, and burning different, fusing different products, and then expanding and then contracting. It could be due to long-term cycles. There's so much going on inside a star, um, and so when the star finally does uh, lose the battle, then that that core now, which might have been at that time. Uh, making elements all the way up to silicon okay and then finally iron all right the outward flow of radiation stops as fusion suddenly halts and that whole core collapses in what we think is about a quarter of a second imagine that the masses of of in some cases multiple uh suns in some of these stars many times the sun's mass tens of times uh suddenly collapsing on itself in a very very short time supernovas happen very fast so it'll be like it's working it's working it's working boom it's gone and it doesn't give you any time to think so luckily our sun is not going to see that fate our sun will see a different fate 
and I can show you what our son's fate will be like if you want to see uh, and to do that we need to take a little journey a little farther south Daryl knows where we're going. Don't give it away. That's not, not me. No, not you. This one. Okay, now you'll see that star up there. Watch it disappear as we head off to this new object. And boom, away we go. And we're going to go to a bright star near this object. There we are. And guess what that star is? That star is none other than my favorite double star. It is the Eye of the Swan in Cygnus the Swan. Right there. It's known as Albirio. And then once Albirio is aligned, then we head off to this beautiful, gorgeous nebula. Right here, known as the Dumbbell Nebula. The Dumbbell Nebula is uh, every kid's first nebula that they they look at because it's really beautiful. I bet it was your first, Daryl. Uh, no, it wasn't. <laughs> really? What was your first? Orion. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, you're right. I mean, Orion Nebula is, of course, the way to go, no doubt. So I'm going to take this down because it's so bright. We're going to go to, say, 10,000, uh, 12,800. And I'm just going to do it for 25 seconds initially. Okay, we should have our guide star by now. And uh, let me first see where it is. I'm going to put on our, our 4K preview here and then increase the brightness. There it is. You can see it right over there. So let me get you out of here and head over to where it'll be more efficacious for us. So we're going to move a little bit east. It's a little bit east and a little bit south. Not much. There we go. Okay. And then we'll turn off our 4K video preview. And now we'll drop this back down to 12,800. All right. For 25 seconds. Waiting for our guide star. Hey, gas mask. Uh, Marson, you may be right. Thinking back... Uh I think I got my first telescope in the summertime, and uh, the Ring Nebula would have been one of the first nebulas I looked at, and I was mightily impressed with it too. Mm -hmm. But I know Orion made the biggest impression on me when I uh, when I first year I got the telescope. Me too, me too by far. Hmm. Let me make sure we don't have any dome issues right now because that. The dome, actually, I'm going to be selling this dome and getting, uh, converting this to a roll-off roof system. Uh, the reason is because we're going to have one in Arizona, and it's going to make it very simple. Uh, there it is. The Dumbbell Nebula, a.k.a. the fate of our sun. Because when our sun finally decides that it runs out of hydrogen for the last time, um, it's going to start to collapse. And when it does, more hydrogen is going to be brought in from the outer envelope, which isn't fusing into helium, by the way. Only in the very center of the core, where it's the hottest and the pressures are highest, can hydrogen actually fuse. But outside, most of the rest of the star is made of hydrogen. That's just plasma. That's just to say the hydrogen atom has been stripped of its electron. And so they just have these, these protons running around outside the... Uh, stars center and those are the uh, hydrogen nuclei and thus plasma so then if, when those get brought into the core now they stand a chance uh, I thought I was going to sneeze uh, they stand a chance to actually um, uh, start fusing into helium atoms again so something like that could happen which would now be a new found fuel and so the star will have initially collapsed and then will go back up again. And now the amount of fuel will make that core bigger and the star will expand and expand and expand and become a very, very big red giant. And that will spell the end of the Sol system for humanity. Because once it becomes a red giant, it will no longer be a hospitable place for us because 
the very planet Earth might actually be swallowed up by the red giant. Then, once it is past its red giant stage, it will push off all these outer layers, just like the nebula here, the dumbbell, possibly. It will push off its outer gas, including, like you see here, oxygen, that, that bluish green we talked about, little neon or hydrogen, like we see here. Um, and it will leave behind in the middle, like we see right there, a very, very hot white dwarf uh, at a very, very hot temperature. Okay, you know, 90 to 100,000 degrees Fahrenheit, about 85,000 Kelvin or so. And so that, that particular white dwarf is so hot that its ultraviolet light, which is most of its spectrum, will cause the atoms to glow like this. And that's what, what we see with these nebulae. When the gas gets too far out, it can no longer glow because it's a little too far from the star. And we've changed our thought processes over the years. We thought maybe these nebulae can only be about a light year in diameter. Well, there are some that are over two light years in diameter. So clearly it's the star, um, the characteristics of the star do matter. You know? And depending on the interstellar medium, if it's really, really dense with other stuff, then it might not reach as far. If it's relatively free, then it might reach out quite far. So there is the Dumbbell Nebula. That's just a beautiful nebula. And, you know, I take pictures of it all the time. And the reason is because I want to see if there's ever any change to it. And we don't normally expect there to be change. But then again, we've taken pictures of galaxies which have had new stars in them. And the new stars are supernovae. You know, these guys again. These types of things that we saw earlier. Um, okay. When those first happened, they actually, the star is so bright you can see it during the daytime uh, in, in some cases. And one such star that will be a daytime bright star when it goes supernova and it's destined to is the star Betelgeuse in Orion. That's the orange star in the upper left corner. That's destined to explode. Oh, yeah. Massive star in the end of its life. Uh, science currently thinks it has about 10,000 years left. Now, it's about 750 light years away. So, if it blew up 749 and 11 months ago, um, 749 years and 11 months ago, then we would um, not know about it for another month. And that supernova light train that's coming with that information showing us that a supernova just occurred is still heading toward us but until that gets here betelgeuse is going to look like a regular normal red star in the sky you know red giant super giant so when we talk about like betelgeuse being um you know a red giant we see a star that's very massive a star like this when it had its red giant stage might look just like Betelgeuse but its mass was going to be a lot lower stars like this are only that, that cause these types of nebulae uh, this is a star death nebula called a planetary nebula named because it kind of looks like a planet when you look at it in, a, in, a, in an eyepiece it looks maybe like a, a faint planet so it's called planetary like or planetary nebula but stars that make these like this are about the mass of the sun and slightly heavier, slightly more massive. So anyway, you might say it was a red giant, while Betelgeuse is a red super giant. And that's exactly right. And that's 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 because of the nature of how we classify stars. You know, when we look at stars, they're actually um, normal stars take infuse hydrogen into helium, like we talked about. And they tend to look like they're on a snaky line on our chart that we make that measures brightness of the stars across the, the color or the temperature down below. And they all seem to, all the normal stars seem to be on a little snaky line that we call it the main sequence. But when you get into stars like Betelgeuse, they have used up their hydrogen and they leave that snaky line and head up north in, on that di diagram to the giant and supergiant territory. 
you know. So Betelgeuse started life, uh, when it started life as a regular star, it wasn't always a red star. Betelgeuse was very likely an O-type star, like an O-9 type star. We have little, you know, zero through nine designations. And actually you can say, you know, not O-0, you know, O-9.5. Okay, you can say that too. Well, anyway, um, Betelgeuse was a bright star. And when, I, I say this often, when, uh, when the precursor to humanity, Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis, that little diminutive four-foot-tall hominid in Africa was wandering around, had Lucy looked up at the constellation Orion, and in that small mind of hers, thought about what those lights were in the sky, she wouldn't have seen an orange light. She would have seen the, the you know only two stars in the belt of Orion, and Betelgeuse would have been bright blue and very bright. It would have been an O star, as bright as like Rigel, which is in the lower right corner of Orion. And so that's um, that's what Lucy would have seen. So the universe changes all around us all the time. It's really cool. Um, so that's the dumbbell um, with our special filter number two. Um, and within within uh, this location, I'm going to actually do one more thing. Uh, I'm going to show you the Eastern Veil one more time with our filter that we have now. Filter the, the wider narrow band, narrow band two. So we'll go back to uh, probably Algena maybe. Let's find out. Yep, we're going to Algena. There it is right there, there it is right there. Okay, hey, get away from me now, you're, you're hot, stay away. Stay away. Okay, and then it's gonna actually get centered up and off we go. And now we're back to, uh, you can see stars coming in, which you couldn't see before because we were using that narrow band filter. That's correct. Daryl puts a very important fact out there that is really important to remember. <clears throat> the diagram is made with respect to our sun and from a position of our looking at our sun. And we see all the stars that are hotter and brighter, all the stars that are cooler and dimmer uh, in that diagram with the sun centered, basically, in that diagram. Okay, we should have our guide star. We're going to do uh, another, we'll do a one-minute exposure here. And I'm going to actually go up a level to 16,000. One minute on the veil east with our slightly wider narrow band filter. I think you'll may appreciate I, it. Yes, go ahead. May I chime in on what we were saying? Please uh, do. Yeah, uh, the main sequence in the Hertz von Russell diagram, it runs from upper left to bottom right, uh, biggest, hottest, brightest, and bluest, down to smallest, coolest, and reddest at the bottom right, the uh, main sequence. That line kind of runs from upper left to lower right. But uh, you'll see stars that have left the main sequence, like the red supergiants, where... They may be relatively cool like the dimmest stars, the uh, red dwarf stars, yep. but they are so big that they are still way up at the upper part of the diagram. And those are the good supernova candidates. That's right. Yeah, and, and um, we've seen supernovas occur in galaxies uh, because you know when you look in the galaxies, the chances are greater that you're going to see a supernova in the galaxy because you can see all of the stars at once almost, you know. Ah, look at this. Look at this. Isn't this beautiful? This is this is the veil with that other filter. Look at the color. Okay, the oxygen is clear. This is likely hydrogen gas caused to glow here. And we see the combination. It's it's a stunning painting, folks. It's a stunning painting on an interstellar tapestry. I just think it's beautiful. Um boy and, you, and it just takes your breath away to see it i know it takes mine away i mean every time i see it i'm i'm astonished at how beautiful it looks oh yeah oh, isn't that something it is yeah gosh i like that almost got to turn up the music and just let this 
be viewed on its own here, you know? While I'm doing that, I'm actually going to look for something else to show you. I have something I got to locate for you. Ah, oh, yeah. That's beautiful. Wow. Ugh. Wow, that's uh, something else. This is the reason I bought my O3 filter. Well, explain the O3 filter so they know what that is. Uh, well, the narrow slices of uh, light that Mark talked about, uh, describing his narrow band filters, uh, O3, oxygen 3, uh, is one of those slices of the filter, and it, it filters out everything but the particular wavelength issued by doubly ionized oxygen. Yeah. And I bought it specifically to look at the Veil Nebula. I got it when I bought that big old Nagler eyepiece I have, the hand grenade. A uh, mm -hmm. huge two inch eyepiece mm -hmm. that. Uh, Giant piece of glass, folks. It's, it's like this big. It's it's an eyepiece. Yeah. You know, it, it literally is this big around. And, you know, when you put that in a telescope, you can almost use two eyes to look through it. Yeah. You know? uh, it's a two inch filter at a two inch eyepiece, so uh, I could thread the filter right into the bottom of the eyepiece barrel. And uh, look at things in pure O3 light. Yep. And that gives you an idea of that specific band. Uh, gives you a really good idea of uh, what amount of that ionized oxygen is in the cloud because it's all you're going to see. Yep. It's all you see. Yeah. And well, you've seen it before. I, I loaned it to you once. I, you the the mirror is so narrow band. Uh, excuse me. The filter is so narrow band. It looks like a mirror. Mm -hmm. That it's just letting a tiny little sliver of light through, all mm -hmm. in uh, this frequency. Yeah. It's kind of a teal or blue green color. Yeah. So he would. When you look at the veil, you see this. Uh, to a lesser extent, this. Only where the oxygen is mixed in with this stuff will you see it. Don't get me wrong, the oxygen is mixed throughout, but the predominant color you see is based on what you actually uh, are passing through the filter. And so um, with our filter, we can pass the oxygen, doubly ionized oxygen. We can pass the hydrogen alpha. We can pass the sulfur um, and uh, to a lesser extent, hydrogen beta, which is another line. Uh, and the filter we're using when we do um, filter number one, the narrow band, that's called a quad band filter. And you might think that those are just, you know, maybe a hundred bucks or whatever. They're not. That filter was over a thousand dollars just for that wow. two inch piece of glass, the quad band filter. And the, this tri band filter that we're using here to see this beautiful spectacle, that filter was. Uh, on the order of about three hundred and fifty dollars, and but when you see this, look me in the eye and tell me it's not worth it. <laughs> well, you know what? You won't know. You don't know, do you? And and to be fair, that's fair actually. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna show you what these filters are buying you, because that's only fair. So we're gonna move over, and I'm gonna go show you so we can uh, go here so we can show you what we're doing. So what you're gonna look at is right here, you're gonna look at our, our our filter selection there. Okay, now we're on spectra. I'm going ahead one more and this will be the darks. Um, and then we'll have the pass through, which is this one. Now to be fair, I should refocus. So I will refocus right now. And I have a focusing uh, setup here that I can use. And as I focus, you'll see the stars get bigger and bloated, and then they get smaller and pointier. Like that. A little better. Okay. And then... Okay, that's probably not perfect, but then again, I really only want to show you in white light what a similar one-minute shot would look like here. In fact, I know I have to drop this down because it's going to be too bright. So let's go down to... Let's go down to... 
say 12,800 and I'm gonna only go for 30 seconds you'll see why okay so now what we're doing now is we're gonna take a picture without any filters and now we're getting the full brunt of the light coming in so let's remind you what you see this is what we see with the narrow band 2 filter that is the lesser narrow band the next shot you're gonna see will be what comes in uh, with the white light okay so this will give you an idea of why the filters are so important okay look at that that's the white light shot in other words that's the comparable white light shot now, I drop down the the sensitivity and I drop down the time and you might say well no make them the same I'll make it equal it's not equal because this would just be a white background practically at those other settings because it's way too sensitive see do you see any of the fancy beautiful intricate detail let's do a comparison let's compare this shot to a similar shot with a filter look at the difference look at that difference this looks like a fuzz right here you can't really see much of anything in there but when we look at it here you actually have intricate little details we can see that this is actually an O3 area this is a hydrogen fuel a hydrogen gas area uh, we can see all this, this detail in here we don't see that when we look here do we it's almost gone so this is why filters folks this is why right here this gives it to you in a nutshell so that said um, we will go back and use our um, telescope adjustment and we're going to go back to filter number narrow band number two okay and I'm also going to refocus because we have to let me bring this up into the focus zone and it's actually a good place to be because that's another thing I want to look at right around there so now we focus this over again I'm sorry you can't hear what's going on out in the dome, but um, the sound, for some reason, doesn't make it in. Uh, you can actually hear the focusing system, and you can hear the telescope moving much of the time. Okay, I don't know why we can't. I thought that was just because it's a mead. <laughs> That's funny, Daryl. Well, meads have a characteristic sound to them. Uh, yeah, they do. Yeah, mine does it too. Yep. That old refractor mount I have, it's a first generation go-to. And uh, mm -hmm. meads can sound like coffee grinders, folks. Then they can. Hey there, Don D. Hey, Raz Taz. How are you guys? Thanks for coming. I'm really enjoying all of you coming out to join us tonight. And if you haven't subscribed, please do. You know, um, we have a new observatory opening up in Arizona that's going to be joining this one. So we'll have an East Coast and a West Coast presence. And that's just the beginning. We have bigger plans beyond that. And we'll share that as we move forward. Yeah. Sorry, I keep touching the mic. Uh, I'm going to start drinking my cup of tea right-handed. <laughs> Is that maybe what's causing I should, it? Maybe I should just put the mic on the right side instead. Yeah. I'm a southpaw, folks. Uh, so am I. I'm a lefty. On the lefties are in their right Ooh, mind, you know. I knew that was coming. Very true. And while I'm waiting here, I'm just going to check my uh, all sky camera. Let's just go into the all sky. This is uh, the all sky. I'm going to actually do some, I'll do some stretches and see if I can. Oh, yeah. Now. There's the Milky Way right there, guys. Right there. Going all the way down. And this is the dome looking ghostly. 
There's a very faint, there's a faint red light on in the dome, but because of the sensitivity of the camera that's taking these images, you'll notice that the dome looks like it's glowing because of that faint red light inside. Isn't that cool? But there's our there's our beautiful summer summer night sky, and we are actually uh, poking around right around here uh, right now. Okay, you see we have Deneb, we have Vega, and we have Altair. These are the three stars of the Summer Triangle. This W right here is Cassiopeia. Okay, and we have, I think that is actually Capella right there. Winter constellation that's rising. And we should see the Pleiades soon. It uh, might be up, but I'm not sure. It's, I think it's down there. Uh, no, uh, should be actually about here, I think. Anyway, it's okay. There's our all sky anyway, just so you can see it. All right, and let's keep it going. And what I do is I take images and I put them together over the course of the night. Nothing is missed because as soon as it finishes one, it's taking another. And I add them up and I make them into a movie at the end of the night. It's really pretty sometimes. You see meteors, you see planes, you see satellites. It's really cool. Okay, so now our location right now is a little bit down um, near the lower part of the veil, the eastern veil. And I want to go even farther down. Um, so we did that, we did this, we changed over to the filter, aeroband 2. I showed you that already. So now what we're going to do is we're going to drop down even more because down below that beautiful gossamer arc that we saw, which was this arc down below that down here, way down below here, there's something else to see. And let's go see. So I'm going to move us over just a little bit, wait our obligatory few seconds and I believe we have narrow band 2 on so um, so now we can go back up to say 20,000 and one minute okay we should have our guide star let's go hey Don McCunzer how are you Thank you, Tara. It is pretty, isn't it? Indeed it is. Yeah, we're waiting for Mars. It hasn't risen. Actually, it might be or it might be up now. Let's go see. Let's move our scope here. the southwest let's go over here yeah there it is yep it's still and this is why I use this this view with these these like the zenith and the regular horizon based lines is because it shows us that Mars is still only about uh, was that 20 18 degrees no, it's actually about just under 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 30 degrees above the horizon. It'll be beautiful shortly. <clears throat> I misspoke our last stream. Uh, I told people that it was up by 10 o'clock. And actually, uh, I've been checking it this week and uh, it's rising uh, by 8.40 p.m. my time now. Well, It'll still take a while to be high, up high enough to look at yeah. for my place. I'm two hours west of Mark, though, so uh, yeah. it's still early in the evening for me. Okay, we got a little bit of... Uh, uh, this is beautiful. This is the lower part of that veil, and it's just a little fuzzy, so we're going to do that one more time. We'll go back to it. So the arc of the veil that we just saw is up above that here, and then down below this is this section right here so that arc continues up there 
This is the lower part of that eastern veil. You'll notice it's all disheveled. It's not cohesive at all like the one above. That's because in this part of the interstellar medium, there might be less material, and so it's rocketing through at a faster rate than up above. And the upper above is being retarded by this uh, wall of density of material, possibly. Down here, there's less. It's only speculation, but it's also possible that it's, all, it's also got clumps and knotty clumps uh, throughout here that are shredding this outflow. Uh, and that's really cool. Look at this beautiful, this beautiful, and I know it's a little uh, out of focus at the moment, or, or trailed, but look at this beautiful doubly ionized oxygen cloud right here. Look at that. That is just stunning. Yeah, we have Mark, a... uh, NLP asked a few minutes ago, where is the light coming from? I assume they mean you know, the, the source. Uh, it's thought to be from compression of the uh, shock front hitting uh, the interstellar medium, right? Yeah, and then the the uh, the star that you know brought this all about uh, is a hot neutron star, and so uh, some of this may very well uh, be due to that ultraviolet radiation. Um, but usually, that's radiation that's uh, near the source, and once it right. gets far enough away, it doesn't affect it anymore. So, but this, this, it's hard for people to understand how gas moving through nothing, apparently, <clears throat> can be compressed by something. But that's what's happening here. You know, it's like, um, imagine if you're, you, you dive into the water. As you're diving, falling through the air, you're pointed like a missile and you say, hey, this is great. Then you hit the water. And what happens to your body? It gets crunched a little bit. It, it changes from really sleek, long, it crunches a little bit. And then you straighten out once you get in the water. Well, same to this gas. As gas moves away from the source, it stays streamlined and straight. Then it hits something a little bit more dense in the interstellar medium, and it gets crunched. And then the gas gets fragmented and separated into these little pieces like this. So that's kind of an analogy for how that works. Can you hang on one second while I get a bottle of water? Sure. Okay, I'll be right back. You might say, too, that uh, another analogy is sort of like uh, when you jump in the ocean at night uh, when the water is nice and warm and uh, you uh, the, the act of you splashing the water uh, helps the organisms in the water uh, give off bioluminescence. I mean, it's not the same process at all, but, you know, the fact of you disturbing the water and the organisms in the water could be, uh, sometimes I've heard that uh, that can uh, trigger the bioluminescence by the organisms. Just an analogy. When you look at the whole veil, uh, it's like three degrees across. I mean, it's huge in the sky. That's like six full moon diameters in the sky. Uh, and even if it's 14 or 15 or 1600 light years away, uh, that is really big. And as Mark said, uh, the neutron star or the black hole or whatever was left after the progenitor star, you know, ended its life. Uh, I would suspect it may be too far away to have much of a direct influence on the gas at this point. And uh, as I understand it, at least, it's uh, what's going on. It's like mostly uh, uh, that's the shock front of the uh, outgoing wave, wave front of the uh, explosion that formed the, uh, that formed the nebula in the first place as it collides with uh, other interstellar material. But it sure is pretty, whatever the reason. Ultimately, that's why I like looking at it. Sorry, that wasn't supposed to take so long. No worries. I apologize. I um, we have a an A and E shoot. Uh, you know, the A and E network is coming here you know, on Monday to shoot a, a show, and <clears throat> I've got stage lights and all kinds of stuff all littering my shipping area and I had to kind of wade through those carefully 
because I didn't want to break into these thousands of dollars worth of material and cameras and stuff. So uh, it took me a little extra time to get my grape flavored water. <laughs> oh my. So, yeah, so when we look at this, then you see these beautiful colors. I, I don't know. I can just. Uh, I'd like to take like 50 photos of this and make a beautiful, beautiful image of this and then uh, get it in the resolution so that people could blow it up to like 25 by 30 in size, you know? It'd be so beautiful. <clears throat> uh -huh. Yeah. But tonight, tonight's not for that because we want to look at other things and, and have some time to look at a bunch of other things. So uh, let's see. Um, I would while we're here and because it's near the zenith I would like to actually go over to this location right here I'm going to go to that star I'll tell you why because that star is in what's called the Pelican Nebula and this is uh, part of what's called the North America Nebula and uh it may just go to the star itself, or it might go to a, a, a finder star. But usually when you tell it to go to a star, it'll go to the star itself. Let's see what it does. Would you excuse oh. me for a moment, please? Yeah, absolutely. It's going to go to Deneb, which is the brightest star. And then it'll zip over to that, that narrower star. I didn't mean narrower. I meant smaller star. Smaller diameter. There we go. This is right in the middle of the Milky Way, um, and the Pelican Nebula in the, is part of this North America Nebula complex, as I said. And this is all dark nebula inside uh, the. Uh, it's all dark nebula inside the, uh, uh, the that's blocking the the brighter nebula behind it. That's how you look at this. All right, this is a tongue of black stuff sticking over the bright nebula behind. Okay, and we see that quite a bit. So what we're going to do is try and capture that black material. So we'll do a one minute at 25,600 and see if we can capture that. We should have our guide star by now. So let's do that, shall we? And then we'll come back to the splendor of the veil in the eastern veil. Just a beautiful sight. I, I have to say, you know, I've, I've never, I've never grown tired of this. You know, I mean, look at the delicate, you know, these these delicate gossamer tendrils right here. They're just beautiful, you know. And then, you know, they come down, they make a way down, and then straight down into this area. Then they they expand out, and then we notice that over here, okay, they're actually doing this this weird little. This weird little uh, motion where they're actually spiraling inwards here because something's breaking up this this cloud this this, this expansion front something's breaking it up um, so maybe pockets of density shred it as it's moving through and in some places where there's not a lot it comes whipping through and in other places where there's not it gets held back so oh, that looks like we have a little bit of the dome in the way uh, okay. Well, you can see the bit of the pelican here. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go move the dome. All right, and I will leave you with a beautiful image here for a moment while I go move the dome. And then I will be back in a second. When Daryl comes back, he'll think something went terribly wrong because he can't hear me. So it does be kind of funny. So I'll be right back. I'm going to go move the dome really fast. Thank you guys for your patience.
Okay. I have returned. Daryl, are you back yet? Oh, I guess he's not back yet. Oh, I'm back. Oh, you are. Okay. What yeah. was the awe about? Because I, I, I was doing a pelican shot and it didn't work, so I got to do another one now. I had to move the dome a little. What? It's not my fault. Oh, oh really? you have to move the dome. You have to move the domes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's still not my fault. Uh, no. Hi, D. Yeah. Smith. <laughs> Go move the dome. Keith, what do you mean the music isn't helping? Oh, you're falling asleep. Oh. Yeah, I get it. You know what? Here. I like I like story music. You know, and when I do talks, I play music in the background, too, because it's just... It's a beautiful experience. I haven't been able to play music when I do some of these talks at conferences because they're like, man, we don't want to play music in the background. It's like, oh. when I do private talks, I play music in the background. It's very faint. It kind of like this. It, it helps set the mood. <clears throat> and you play it before they come in. And while the people are coming in, you're playing the music. It's a show. People they want to be entertained, you know? Ah, uh, there we go. I right. did that once uh, at a uh, federal, not a national park, but it's uh, like a park administered by the feds here in Colorado. Okay. Uh, I had space music all queued up and started playing it. and The ranger uh, made me shut it off. It was, well, actually, she didn't even make me. She shut it off herself. <laughs> Why? Uh, she said it would disturb the wildlife, I think. Oh, God. Yeah. Okay. I mean, what the park was known for, uh, was, it's a fossil bed. It's the remains of an mm -hmm. ancient uh, fossilized forest, like petrified <clears throat> wood. Yeah. And, the, you know, my thought was, well, that ain't going to disturb the rocks, but uh, she was adamant. Had to turn the music off. Well, yeah, mood music is nice. Yeah. A little fantasy. I like, I like space music. Yep. That's this. Hey, fantasy. Hello, Carol. Yeah. Well, we're doing another uh, shot here. This is the Pelican Nebula. This is the eye. You can see some of this area here. Um, and it really looks beautiful when you actually do processing of it. Um, <clears throat> and I've done some really nice processing of this which really shows very nicely uh, so I'm trying to see if maybe while we're waiting for the photo to come in I might be able to catch some of that for you and yeah, maybe I can this is with the wider narrowband filter right that is correct yeah I see we're calling it the thing I call it now, the wider narrow band. I could say the tri-band filter versus quad band, but, you know, <clears throat> I think that calling it calling it this makes it a little bit more uh, understandable, you know. So there's our, another image that came in. That's really pretty. And you can see now a little bit more. This is the the eye of the pelican and this is the top of the head and the back here it goes down it, it it's very very big it doesn't fit in the whole field but this is a beautiful nebula gossamer not so much uh, you know as, as the other veil but you know in its own way very diffuse and gorgeous <clears throat> yeah so we go now to our other view here. And let's go look at our, let's go look at, uh, let's see, let's also get our field of view. Okay, and I wanna move us over here. So we're gonna go and just take our cells down a notch I will alter our speed of our movement 
to say here and bring us down a little bit from that star that's quite a bit down we'll go a little more up okay and then we're gonna head toward the east a little a little bit more a little bit more a little bit more okay and now let's say right here all right Gulf of Mexico you got it and then we're gonna go take a Gulf of Mexico photo this is why right it's called above the North Yucatan America. yeah that's right right above where Chicxulub little impact was uh -huh. um, you can see the resemblance of North America here with Mexico and Florida and that's why it's called that and, and the pelican what I was talking about you know the pelican is this right here and there's the top of the head and it comes down and goes around a deeper shot that we've done before would show more of it and I've, I've actually been able to show quite a bit of it um, so it looks really pretty if that's North America that must be about the King Kong of pelicans <laughs> you bet I think more than King Kong okay so let's take this picture uh, we have our filter, we have our time frame, we have our subject, and we have our guide star. And then we're going to be going to Mars here in a little while as well, because we, Mars is going to, I think Mars is going to really look pretty tonight. Yeah. It's just a beautiful night here. Really, really pretty night here. Uh, you might remind me later. I can send you uh, the good map I found today. Okay. Uh, it, well, I never did find the one again that I found earlier in the week. Uh, it corresponded very well to what we saw the other night, and it named all the features. Uh but I found it? I found actually two more today that are about as good. Okay. Wow. That's pretty cool. Okay, there is the Gulf of Mexico in our North America shot. Okay. You can see the Gulf of Mexico right there. There's Florida, Gulf of Mexico. You see this area? You want to see what that looks like when we process it? Uh, that looks like this, if this is going to do it right. Maybe not that. Uh, let's find out. Hang on, let me actually, let me get the, the I want to show you the actual screen here. Uh, maybe this one. Yep. Okay, this is what it looks like when you process it. And let me uh, move it up a little more and get it to your full size. So that's a little bit more processed, but so is uh, this other one I'll show you. Let me, let me grab it because it really is pretty. This is what you want to see. Check that out, and this is when you process it. Look at that. That's just beautiful. Just beautiful. Ah. And that's what happens in Sky to Livestream. I take these pictures, and then I'll process them and, and let them let them go off to you. You can do anything you want with them. They're all free. You know? Stick with me, friends, and I'll just show you the world. And the universe for free. Alrighty, so uh, let's go back here. So this is our gulf, like we talked. All right. So these nebulae, as you can see, are very, very extended and and far flung, and faint in some cases. Um, now while we're here, I want to see if we continue the pattern and head over. 
and go to something else over here. Hmm. You were talking about Cepheus. Uh, That's right. That's right. I've seen pictures of the Wizards Nebula just recently. That was an Apod photo, and uh, I think the elephant's trunk. Yeah, I wonder if we see the elephant's trunk because that's a dark nebula, I believe. Mm. But we could. I mean, what I'm getting at is we could see it because I could process it, but I want to show people that. Okay, let's go to the wizard nebula and try that. You'll see the stars disappear. And they're gone now. And we're whipping around. What star will we use for a guide? Well, here we are. There we are. Okay, so we're actually going to slowly slow down and pick up on uh, Zeta Cephas, Zeta Cephi, and then we're going to go over to the Wizard Nebula over here. So it's centering up the Wizard Nebula soon. It's got to get Delta Cephi lined up. The guide scope will then process that and say, okay, it's centered. Let's go to the Wizard. I know where that is. And then next thing you know, it's like a magic trick. Poof, it's gone. We zip by uh, Delta Cephi here and end up heading to the wizard. And now we're... Can you... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. Go, uh, proceed. Oh, no, I was going to say we're just going to the wizard nebula, so that's right here. Okay. And now we're getting our guide star. And I'm going to take us down to uh, 30 seconds at 25,600. One thing you'll notice is that this, this camera can actually go to 409,000. And to give you an idea of what that looks like, okay, okay, that's uh, 160,000, 104, 320. There's 409,600 right there. Okay, let's do a five second photo. And I wanna show you what happens. Uh, at the wizard with the wizard's nebula it's a great way to find something let's be honest okay great way to find something but here we go so just five seconds but at the maximum speed the camera can do wow look at all that noise but you see a nebula right there okay and you know, get rid of some of the noise, and you can see it's very choppy. There's a lot of noise in this image. Those are supposed to be stars. So what do we do? Well, we have to basically go back and use a subset of that speed. So we come through here again, and we'll go up to, say, um, let's say that 3,200 most cameras go to, 4,000 they go to, 5,000 they go to, 6,400 they go to. Some cameras even go to 8,000. But going to 10,000 and beyond is the realm of some of the newer DSLRs. You know, digital single lens reflex. That's what that stands for. Um, and so let's just do at 10,000 10, ISO, let's go up and do a... Uh, 15 seconds and see how it looks this is the wizard nebula we're working on right now should be okay right I have my microphone on the right side now okay I feel like I put my shoes on the wrong feet oh yeah that's that's true it does feel that way so, okay, at 15 seconds, you'll notice that we only see the faintest suggestion that there might be a nebula here. So this gives you an idea how difficult it is to capture some of these objects. Okay, so we go back, and now let's go... Uh, I'm going to move it, actually, kind of get it back. Oops, I forgot to tone down the speed let's do that first okay speed is toned down that's better okay let's try now upping the speed at 16,000 is good and we'll go to 25 seconds 
I do expect that we are looking at the Wizard Nebula. That's the Wizard Nebula right there in Stellarium. Now these are all in Stellarium process shots. Most of them are actually not too good. Um, and we've done much better. But it's okay. I love Stellarium for the fact that I can use it to control the telescope. Okay, you can see a little bit of the Wizard Nebula right there. Okay. And what we would do is... Yeah, it's actually pretty clear right there. So now, if I want to really get a good shot of it, I would actually take us to a minute. Knowing I have it in the view. And I would actually just go toward the east a little bit. All right, like that, <clears throat> a little more. Okay, let the guide star be found, and then I'll go up to 25,600. So we've, we've gone up several stops. Tara's going to bed. All righty. Okay, you go to bed, Tara. I mean, for you, it's, uh, no, she can't be going to bed. It's only 8.30 for her. In Arizona. Yeah, in Arizona. Okay, we have our guide star. Let's do this. Maybe she'll come back later. I don't know. After this, we're going to go to Mars. We've been waiting for Mars, haven't we? Sure. Yeah, and actually, just to see, you know, Mars is now... Uh, higher in the sky. I want to make sure that we get it higher in the sky. Oh, and uh, we are going to go... I do want to look at the Garnet Star. We're going to go to the Garnet Star next. I actually wanted to see a beautiful uh, carbon star tonight. Okay, so now this next exposure will be done here shortly. You'll see what one minute versus 30 seconds looks like and with a higher and with a higher ISO waiting yep we're still waiting here we come all right now you see it look at that okay and this is this is the wizard nebula you can see the dark lanes in here this dark, beautiful gas in here. 20, 20 photos of this would turn this into a beautiful photograph for everybody. But I'm not going to make you sit through that. Because we have other things we want to see. There'll be time for us to do that at other points in the season. They look pretty though, huh? Let's see what our sky looks like. Oh, lights on. That's someone. That's what I thought. I had somebody come back home. <clears throat> okay. All right, so that's that's the Wizard Nebula now, and that's with that is with our narrow band two filter. Now let's just do another similar one with the narrow band one filter. Okay, and we're gonna drop the speed oh, a little bit, and it's actually a fainter filter. You might say, why are you dropping the speed? Um, well, I'm dropping the speed because I want to reduce the noise. We'll do a minute at that, and you'll see, potentially see more details in here that this filter doesn't show. But look at the rest of the nebula down here. See that? A lot of extra nebula down here. Really, really pretty. Wowie. That's right, Carol. Carl, we're going to be seeing the Mars. Uh, that we're going to see the Mars action pretty soon. Mark, uh, speaking of, uh, I could, maybe should send you that map now. Uh, would you rather me send it as a file or just send you a link to it? Uh, why don't you, if you have it as a file, just send it in the Skype chat and I will, yeah. I will save it to the desktop and we'll bring it up in, in this, uh, in, uh, Earthen View and check it out. Very good. <clears throat> okay. 
yeah, the Wizard Nebula right there. And this is now the narrow band filter view of the Wizard Nebula. And whereas you don't think you're seeing as much, you have to understand that the narrow band filter allows us to see more dark lanes. Look at all the extra dark lanes in here that are visible now that weren't before. It doesn't look it, but this filter is worth its weight in gold. Really is worth its weight in gold. Amazing, huh? Yeah, there's the picture. Alrighty. Okay, so let's take this. Okay, and it should be saved to my downloads file. Downloads directory. And let's go see if we have it here. Let's go see. And we do. All right. Okay. Well, we'll have it here in a minute to go look at. All okay. right. So there we go. And now what we'll do is we'll come back <clears throat> and rejoin the show already in progress. Uh, actually, I do want to as I mentioned, I do want to go check out this beautiful carbon star. And if you don't know what a carbon star is, folks, then just you wait and see. Because carbon stars are amazing. Alright. And let's see, we are up here at Alderman. Alderman, actually. Which is one of the stars in Cepheus, I believe. And Alderaman is going to be centered, and then we're going to head off to a star that's going to look like a, unlike any star you've seen. That's what I like about these stars. It's hard to believe that they can have the color that they do. But they do. Is this a famous carbon star? Yes, it is. This is the Garnet Star. Oh, Herschel's Garnet Star? There it is. I see. Yep. And now we're going to center up on Herschel's Garnet Star. And then we'll take a photo of it. And you might say, well, it looks just like a little red star. Yeah, but it's very red. It's so red, in fact, that it, it literally doesn't look like it should exist. These stars are red, guys, because they actually have a real preponderance of of, of uh, carbon in their outer atmospheres, carbon molecules as well, and uh, this causes like a soot, which is what carbon is, right? In in copious amounts, it's like soot. All right. So 25 seconds here uh, at 10,000. Let's check it out. <clears throat> I can only think of two uh, carbon stars offhand, I think. Uh, it's either the Garnet Star or the Crimson Star. And you said uh, Garnet, so this is Garnet. it was Herschel's Garnet Star. Yes. The other one being Heinz Christmas Star, or Heinz Crimson, Crimson Star. Star. Yep. Okay. And there is <clears throat> we're out of focus a little bit too incidentally I can see that so we'll have to refocus what happens is uh, as the mount moves around sometimes it'll go out of focus and we are in narrow band 1 let's go to narrow band 2 though and check out the same photo and see if that's also as out of focus. I suspect it is. <clears throat> so I hope you guys are having fun. We're having fun tonight, just checking things out, going out to the different locations in the sky. Yep, yep, yep. All right, and then uh, uh, 25 seconds in, we'll be over in no time. Look at that. I mean, look at the beautiful color, huh? And it's not focused, so I do want to focus it before we move on to Mars. We do want to focus ahead of time. 
And here we go. Last time we went to Mars, we actually saw Phobos and Deimos. It was really nice. Okay, and then we'll have the focus set up here coming up. Uh, let's do this. Okay, there we are. All right, and I gotta just move my star over for focus adjustment. You to become a member of the focus group. Oh yes, and there it is, the star. Amazing to think that these stars sit out in space and draw our attention like you can't believe you know but they are amazing and sometimes when you go out of focus with a star you can see the color better but you really need to do that with the pass through where you're not showing any filter in particular but you can see the color here Right, let's try that. Okay, let's do 20 seconds at 10,000. <clears throat> I hate to say it, but winter's approaching. I feel it in my bones. I cannot mm -hmm. wait to get out into Arizona. Oh. Tell me about it. Okay. Never mind, don't. <laughs> okay, that's better. Look at this. Look at that. Look at that star. It looks unlike any star you've seen. That's nice. Yeah, that's a beautiful, beautiful star. Um, and if we're going to look at Mars next, I have to go move the dome. So shall I leave this up? And you can look at this while I head out to do that. Sure. All right, I'll be right back. Folks, I'm going to post a link for you. Uh, we're going to be referring to a Mars map I found, hopefully. At, uh, if you follow the link, you can see the same map. Give me just a moment. Okay, if you follow that link, that should show you the same map I sent to Mark. He'll probably put up a smaller version of it on screen. Or maybe he will. Hopefully. We were seeing a lot of detail on Mars uh, the last stream. Saturday night, Sunday night, whenever that was. Uh, it was subtle at times. And I think we were working pretty close to the limits of the camera, if not the telescope. Uh, uh, but we could see certain features the maybe I'll talk about if and when he puts up uh, the map <laughs> and when we look at Mars now uh, you're welcome Gina Isabella NLP um, as I mentioned earlier uh, Mars has some interesting similarities to Earth in that it rotates in about the same time we do actually a little bit longer um, it takes I think about 24 hours and 40 minutes for Mars to complete one rotation and compared to our day of 24 hours um, well what you would see if you looked at the same if you looked at Mars the same time every night you would actually see uh, the surface of Mars moving from uh, right to left, or as we viewed it from east to west, a little bit more 
40 minutes every night on his way to uh, seeing a complete rotation of the planet backwards. Um, so what we see tonight is going to be uh, a little farther to the east than what we saw last weekend. But they won't be able to tell that. Um, unless I well, look in Stellarium and point it out explicitly, right? I shared them a link to that map I sent you. Oh, okay, good. And I was just telling them the difference in uh, Mars Day versus an Earth Day and oh, okay. how it will have changed over the last week. Okay, that's cool. You know, what I said to you in uh, Skype earlier that I think we were actually looking at uh, Elysium Mons, not Olympus Mons the other night. Uh, yeah. Hopefully tonight we're going to get a good look at Olympus Mons and Tharsis. We'll be looking farther to the east around the planet. Yeah, actually, if we uh, go into our Stellarium Knock here. What? Knock on wood. Oh, yeah. Yes, knock on my head. I do that, too. I'm wood, yes. I'm a wood head. Yeah, hello. Okay, let's um, get out of here. There's a helix nebula down there. And then let's go to Mars. Let's zoom in on Mars here and check out what we expect to see. Ooh. Okay, that'll be interesting. If we, if we, let's see if we can see these different features tonight. You know. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Well, there we go. So that's that's where we're going, and we'll have Phobos and Deimos on the same side of Mars tonight. So let's go back to our selection. Actually, let's do this. Since I know we already have it, I can go hit control to get us moving in that direction. Come back to our view here and bring up our system. And let's see which star. See the star just zoom by. I don't know if you saw that, but it did just zoom by. And it's heading out to find our next guide star. Sharatan. There's Sharatan up there. One of the two bright stars in Aries, the other one being Hamal. That's right. There's Hamal. Yep. Interestingly, Mars also... Uh, not only has a similar length of day as Earth, it also has a similar axial inclination. Yeah. Makes you wonder sometimes. Yeah. It does. It makes you wonder what might have happened to Mars. You know? Okay, first things first. While we got this set up, let's actually drop this exposure down a little bit. Okay. And let's reduce this. It's going to be a fraction of what it was. There we go. It's amazing how small Mars will actually get in our view. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go back down. We'll take this down to 50. ISO, the smallest, lowest value. Okay. Let's take that and see how we look. 40th of a second. Well, let's zoom in, shall we? Okay, it's not in focus, so we're going to have to focus it. Doing the focusing is critical because that makes the difference between seeing anything at all and seeing nothing at all. So let's go into our focus mode. There we are. There's Matt. There's Matt is right there. We've got Mars in our view, Captain. Scotty, where is Mars? It's right in front of you, Captain. Okay, now let's focus that. Let's 
try that. Have you given any consideration to trying eyepiece projection? Yeah, I actually have an eyepiece projection uh, system, but I don't have a way to do it for the camera yet. Ah. And once you do that, you're committed to that for just planets. Right. Okay. I mean, you know, ideally you could manufacture a rotor, rotary head that will actually change the appendages on the telescope, you know? Yes. And uh, I would totally welcome doing that, and I could actually make it work. You know, I can make that happen. That's just the... Uh, that's just the uh, programming phase. That, that's nothing. Okay, you know what I have to do is I'm going to... I want to focus on a star. Uh, we are on narrow band 2. That's good. So maybe I can just try this one more time. Actually, let me do something else. Bear with me, folks. I'm going to try something. There is a guy here, uh, just north of me, in fact, uh, named Paul Van Slyke. Uh, he ran Black Forest Observatory, which is just north of town here. Okay. Uh, he was quite a machinist, and he was making big dollar, heavy duty, uh, oh, like uh, eyepiece turrets and camera setups and filter holders and all sorts of things. Uh, great, big, humongous very expensive stuff wow. uh, I wouldn't have been surprised if he had built such a thing you know that you could swap out whole optical trains and stuff on the fly uh, uh, his his business got caught in the black forest fire back in 2013 and burned it to the ground uh. and I I never heard if he's back in business or not I don't think he is poor guy yeah, he had quite a setup. He uh, he built his own 40-inch telescope. Uh, he wow. built the observatory. He had uh, computer equipment like you wouldn't believe. Uh, uh, looked like a separate room for it, like a mainframe or something. And uh, okay. the guy just built an observatory grade instrumentation. Wow. Uh, and it wasn't cheap. I can imagine it wasn't. But it burned to the ground. Okay, well, we're getting closer here. We actually saw some really nice features the other night. Uh-huh. So I just have to continue to try and, re you know, iterate through this focus issue. Okay, let's do that, shall we? Still working at it. Is that live video? Yes. Yeah. You can really see the seeing. Yeah. Which uh, Daryl's responding. What he's saying is the seeing. S e s e e i n g. The seeing. Uh, it corresponds to how turbulated <laughs> the atmosphere is. How turbulent the atmosphere looks. Uh, the transparency is how much uh, water vapor or uh, other. I guess uh, hazards to or, or uh, occluders of fine seeing okay are between us the transparency is kind of like uh, um, the transparency is the clarity basically of the sky and here we actually see that it's not 
very clear. We actually have a... We're looking through some... Hey, look at this. <laughs> That's what we got from Mars right now. Huh. Now, it's not... All it, I mean, it's, it looks more like that. That's actually what it looks like, but you know, <laughs> that's kind of interesting because it really it comes from an object that's really that big. You know. Yeah. Pretty cool. When when we see Mars, it's only about twice the diameter of the Moon. It's not very big in and of itself. Yeah, and, and when he says twice the diameter of the moon, that's not in the sky. That's actual size. Right. About 2,000 versus about 4,000 miles, or about half the size of the Earth, half the diameter of the Earth. Yeah. And even when it's at its closest, like it's coming to be pretty good, this opposition, which is a perihelic opposition, as I mentioned earlier, uh... It only it's only going to subtend I think about 22 and a half uh, arc seconds in the sky yeah which is pretty darn small now this looks like about the well let's see I read somewhere the other day they said this is going to be the best opposition until the year 2035 Wow so get them while they're hot. Well, we can see a, a dark area on the face of the planet right there. Yep. Uh, can see a little dark up toward the top. Yeah, up here. And a little bit of white toward the top, which I assume is the North Polar Hood again. And we can see the South Polar Cap. Right there. <laughs> Not bad. Not bad. Now, technically, uh, we're slighted uh, with the colors a little toward the blue. That's why it looks more magenta y. Okay. Um, but let's let's do what we did last time. If you recall, and I'll just, just put this in here. Uh, we're going to go down to narrow band number one. Okay. Remember we did that before? Uh-huh. Yeah, we actually had some really interesting views. You can barely see it now, so I'm going to increase the uh, exposure. We have to go up to like 0.4 seconds now. Maybe that's a little too hot. We'll find out. Yeah, it's too hot. Let's try a sixth of a second. That seems to have been my go-to. Yeah, that's nice. Look at that. See what the difference in the filters is? You can actually see this, this area a lot more pronounced now. Uh-huh. And what area is that? Well, I'll show you. Um, I will show you. Going by the map I sent you, I think we're looking... Uh Maybe Marisarinum with uh, uh, Thalmasia and Ballus Marineris on the right and Chrysi Planitia at the upper right. Chrysi Planitia, where Viking landed. Right? That where Viking went down, went, landed there, I think. Uh, I don't remember offhand. I did find another map similar to this, though, that showed locations that we were looking at uh, last stream, mm -hmm. which is over at, uh, I think Certus Major was just out of view to the left now, but we were looking at Mare Tyrenum, uh, Mare Samarium, and then Olympus Elysium Mons up to the upper left of it, uh, the uh, what we thought was Olympus Mons, yeah, and uh, Terra Samaria down below it. Uh, the, that's actually a lot of the lunar, a lot of the Mars landers are concentrated in that view we saw the other night. Yeah, I know Ronald asked about it. So in our view tonight, um, 
we can actually use Stellarium to show us the proper facing of the planet because they calculate what the right <laughs> facing of the planet should be. So let's do that. Yeah. yeah, we should, I think, I think Valus Marineris is actually kind of right in the center of what we're seeing right now. In fact, I'm sure of it, actually, it is. So, um, let me uh, show you. Let's go back to our view here. You'll notice there's Valus Marineris right there. And there's that central fluvial fan. Actually, it's not even a fluvial fan. It's actually a collapsed land there. So there it is. And so that is what we should be able to see here. We're seeing this general dark area here, which is here. Uh huh. But I don't think we're seeing. Uh, I don't think we're seeing. I don't think we're seeing the exact, uh, I don't think we're seeing that. Yeah, you can see the South Polar Cap very clearly here. Mm -hmm. This filter seems to be very good at showing us the South Polar Cap. You know? And you, you can see the, uh, dark creatures in the Northern Hemisphere also, and it looks like, uh, it's coming farther down on the, over toward the right limb. Yeah. Which is, uh, crisy. That's right, right here. If I'm looking at that map right, yes. Because, um, well, keep in mind, okay, if we go back to that map for just a sec, okay, keep in mind that, you know, Crisis is going to be right above the horizontal 90 degrees, and, you know, straight up off of uh, Valus Marineris there. And that's somewhere in here. So that's Chrysi Planitia right here. Right here. Almost exactly right there. Yep. That's incredible. All, all I see is, your, uh, is the map right now. Oh, duh. Yeah. You would. So yeah, as I was saying, we see Chrysi Planitia right here. Okay. We see this large area here. That is right there. That darker area inside this area. That's that's like, uh, I think that's like, is that Noctis Labyrinthus? Um, no, that's not what I want to say. It, that's, it's the middle of Valus Marineris. In other words the middle is here <clears throat> that corresponds to this right here uh-huh and we can't quite see this uh, maybe if I take a video and then stack it we'll we'll be able to see it you know stack each frame and make a final photo we might be able to check it out might be able to see it but without doing, like you say, eyepiece projection, we've got a lot of pixels that are, you know, just seeing black sky. Yeah. But still, this is really pretty, isn't it? It is. And I, there, I like the other night, I mean, it took some looking, but sometimes it was like we could pick out a surprising amount of detail. I think I'm almost seeing more in the north than I am in the south. Yeah, I think what I can do is if we actually go back and just take some more pictures. Uh, as Mars moves, look at that black thing up there. Is that an artifact? Let's drop it down to an eighth. Hard to tell. Wow. Looks really nice, though. I mean, I 
It does. Uh, over on the lower left, uh, toward the limb of the planet, there looks like a kind of a protruding dark feature there. This right here. Uh, a little higher up. Not this. No, right there where your pointer is. Really, this? Yeah, I see a little dark thing poking up. Huh, wonder what that is. Let's find out. Let's go back and take another photo. Make sure it's not just you seeing things. Uh, well, looking at the map, they show nothing poking up big right there. Maybe oh. I am just seeing things. <laughs> if it was anything, it would be uh, the... Oh, golly. Uh... The area of uh, what they call uh, Zephyria. Okay. Off of Mare Mar Sarinum. Yes. And they don't really show any big projecting dark feature there, so. Well. Maybe I'm just seeing things. It could be the way. The light is on Terra Samaria. You know? It could be that. The way the light is playing on that. I mean, we're looking could at... Because we're looking at... Um, we're looking at this large... Uh, extensive... Let me just go show you what I mean. We're looking at this large, extensive area of darkness over here. And that's that's exactly what we're seeing. Okay. Right here. Mm-hmm. Right? Yep. This is I a, think so. This is a large, extensive dark area right here. Unless it's another artifact, it looks like the projection coming down from the upper right is uh, showing one distinct dark creature also. Maybe it's just an artifact. Maybe yeah, I'm seeing things. Yeah, yeah. Let me. Um, the only way we can figure that out is to actually take more pictures. Captain, we've got to take more pictures. Here we go. You can see that south polar cap very clearly, guys. You can see it right there. You see how that looks like it's a white protruding thing? Yeah. And don't forget, Mars is the only planet in our solar system entirely populated by robots. There you go. As far as we know. Yeah, I think it's really pretty. Let me uh, try the other filter here again. We're going to go to narrow band 2. That'll be too bright, so i got to stop that down. As Mars gets higher in the sky, we should actually see it getting better. Yeah. Hey, fantasy. Hey, she's fantasy's back. Welcome back. Okay, let's do this. Yeah, just I don't know. It seems like uh, it seems like I'm not quite focused. So we're struggling probably for no reason. Let me try and. Do this one more time. Okay, and whoop to do. Here we go. Bring us up. Bring us in, Mr. Scott. Too far, Mr. Scott. You're fired. Aye, sir. Okay, so let's. It's actually pretty turbulent tonight, anyway. Yeah. But more so than the other night. When uh, an image, a new image first comes up, it shows a uh, pixelation. Uh, 
is that the actual pixel sizes or is it bending pixels like four by four or what? No, it's actually you're looking at the actual size. Oh. Huh. Isabella, why is it so pink? Uh, it's getting a little bit of a cast to it from the uh, filters he's using. Uh, it's really sort of a orangey brown, kind of a rust red color. Yeah, you know what? I can show you, Isabella. Uh, it won't be in focus, but what I'll do is I will, I will put us into the pass through. So you can see the exact color. Right? So that's the exact color. You don't see it yet on the screen because I I don't have it up there. That's actually not the exact color either. That's a photo, captured photo. This is the exact color. What I'm gonna do is drop this down and show you this at a hundred and sixtieth of a second. Okay, again, like I said, it won't be in focus. That's what Mars color is actually looking, what it actually looks like. Okay. So that's the actual color, not the focus of the planet. I, I can't focus and, you know, keep going back and forth on that. Uh... Fantasy, I'm in Colorado, and uh, the air quality is terrible here also. Uh, the sky has been so wiped out by the smoke and the haze that uh, the last two nights uh, I went out for looks, and all I could see was Jupiter, Saturn, uh, Mars a little later in the evening, plus uh, the three stars in the summer triangle, Denver, Vega, and barely could see Altair. Wow. That was all I could see. There have been nights so bad or days so bad that I could barely see two blocks here in the daytime. It was really bad about 10 days ago. Wow, that's terrible. And uh, was it last night I think I went out and you could smell the smoke really strongly. Yeah, we can smell it here uh, yesterday and part of today. This is a better shot there. Look at that. Mm -hmm. We actually can pick out some of the uh, some of Alice Marinara's here. Yeah, we can pick yeah. out some of the marinara sauce there, Doc. Yeah, interesting. Let's go back here and take another. Wow. Uh. I'm starting to wonder what I thought I was seeing up in the upper right before now. Yeah. This is with the wider band filter, right? Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. Let's change over to the, the narrow band, number one. The most narrow of them all. May I make a suggestion? Yeah. Uh, once you get your filters changed, uh, try live video. You may see the uh, seeing, you know, come and go, but you may get good moments of uh, better seeing. Yeah. Just thought. No, that's a good one. We can do that. Just think, folks, the temperature there is down hovering around 70 below zero on average that's pretty cold there and you can still see it it's some distance away but boy that's really cold hey it's almost summer in the southern hemisphere on Mars yeah but you know what it's not as cold as it is on some of the moons in the solar system 
Io is an amazing moon. During the day, Io has an atmosphere of sulfur and sodium ions. And at night, and at what's night, it goes around Jupiter on the other side of Jupiter. When it's in Jupiter's massive shadow, the atmosphere rains out on Io. It rains down and lands back on the moon. Only to uh, sublimate later on when Io reemerges and cause the most amazing uh, assemblage of atoms around the moon. It's crazy. Yeah. Wow. Well, I know we're having fun, but I have to say that um, I am getting quite tired. I still have to go out there and close up and hopefully not have to fight a mountain lion. <laughs> we got a mountain lion in the neighborhood now. And it's just, uh, again. Oh, God. Again. But I'll leave you with Mars. And uh, I'll say that I appreciated my time with you guys. And thank you for your kind donations. Make sure you subscribe and hit that bell. Get notified of our next streams. And we will have fun again. All right. So I will see you later. And actually, I'm saying hello to Wise Eye now. Uh, yeah, opportunity is there. And so is Spirit. And opportunity basically could probably have been rejuvenated had they been able to uh, get a signal to it. But it was in that deep state and it never came out of it. It's hibernation state. It's still there. Waiting dutifully for the next potential opportunity to send us data and to be our eyes on Mars. <coughs> Perseverance will be soon and it's going to land the same way as the other rovers uh, using the sky crane. Um, it's done. It worked twice so far and it'll work more. Well, thank you, Carol. It's very kind. Thank you all for coming. And we'll talk soon. I leave you with Mars. You guys have good a night, good, everybody. You guys have a good night. And we'll talk on our next SkyTour live stream. <laughs>